This recorded lecture is to introduce the notion of ecoepidemiology as a subspecialty of epidemiology that connects ecosystem health to human health. This lecture was first delivered in November of 2010 and it is now updated and recorded on December the 4th, 2012 out of my position of visiting fellow at the University of Canberra in Australia. The lecture consists of 80 slides, the first 60 of which deal with the justification for why ecoepidemiology is so relevant to saving the human species from itself. The last 20 slides deal with very hopeful indicators that would suggest that major changes are afoot to in fact accomplish the uh, sustainability of life as we know it on the planet. The questions to ponder before we actually begin this webinar just to get our minds open and receptive to the complexities of these issues. Uh, first question, are we as humans utterly dependent on the ecosystems in which we live and indeed on the biosphere, not only for our health and well-being but also for our survival? What do we mean by the concepts of moral integrity, structural integrity, scientific integrity, ecological integrity and biological integrity? I'll be providing definitions of these as we move through the lecture. And what is our role as professionals and in fact as citizens of the world in relation to questions of conservation and sustainability? So over the next hour and a half, there are three learning objectives. First, to understand the link between ecological systems and human health by examining indicators that point to declines in ecological integrity, both at the local as well as at the global levels, to identify ways in which ecoepidemiology can be applied for understanding the dynamics between ecosystem change and human health. And the whole idea here is to be able to have sensitive enough health indicators to be able to prevent catastrophic harms from happening. And the third learning objective is to recognize the strengths and limitations of the echoepidemiological approach for informing policy at the primordial prevention level. And this requires an opening of our minds. So I'll take us through why this opening of our minds is so important to address these very important global issues. But first it's uh, relevant to put us all on the same footing in terms of our classical epidemiological training and backgrounds as currently uh, our major focus is in these areas. Uh, we study at the distribution, that is where diseases occur and the determinants, what's causing these diseases and uh, the idea is to study disease in populations and its application of their control uh, in, in, at, at a population level. Our focus is on preventing harms to populations, whether we're talking about illness, early death, and general social well-being. Now, traditionally, we've been trained to focus on these three areas of prevention, primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention. Primary prevention, and briefly, is where we educate to avoid exposure or work with communities to help them avoid exposure. Secondary prevention, deals with early detection, the idea there being that if you intervene early enough, if you identify a problem and intervene early enough, then there's the better prospect of, of uh, wellness at the end of the day. And tertiary prevention is where we restore people to the best quality of life possible after they've become ill. But the focus of this lecture really is on primordial prevention. This concept was first presented to my knowledge by the World Health Organization uh, book on uh, epidemiology and primordial prevention deals with the highest levels of policy that define all of social behaviors and that constrain and encourage and provide incentives and disincentives for all kinds of behaviors. So I'll come back to that as we move through the lecture. The policy relevance of, this, uh, of, of our field of epidemiology 
is that we are, after all, the science that is basic to rational, that is evidence-based public health policy formulation. And of course, the big assumption there is that the people in the policy realm uh, are amenable to considering evidence as opposed to being driven by ideological uh, rationale. What we do as scientists is we, uh, in public health and epidemiology as the science basic to public health, is we bridge toxicologically demonstrated evidence with policy by examining the human evidence for what we find in research or what toxicologists find in research based on animal models. So then from our perspective in epidemiology, our job is to inform policy with a view to reducing harms by preventing disease and premature mortality at the population or community level. When we concern ourselves with global ecological changes, ecology being the, the systems within, within which we are embedded for the production of the services that we take so for granted from nature, such as fresh air, clean water, nutritious soils, um, when we concern ourselves with these broader issues that, as I say, we take so for granted, how can we more effectively deliver on this obligation when we keep hearing the trends of ecological changes and so much being in decline that sustains life? Is there a bottom that we could hit? Are there thresholds that we could hit that could result in catastrophic uh, uh, harms to populations? And under expanding global and local disparities and inequalities, again, what is our obligation? How can we effectively inform policy by examining disparities and inequalities? Traditionally, in our public health uh, work, we have focused for hundreds of years on issues of sanitation, on questions of water quality, food safety, air quality, and vaccination programs. Typically, uh, we see low endemic levels of communicable diseases in populations. And then what we do in epidemiology is once a pathogen has emerged or entered a population with a certain defined incubation period for that particular pathogen, we see a spike in the incidence of illness and we can intervene in some way and then hopefully see a decline over time, the idea being that we should intervene before the, um, or as early as possible, before the major spike and the continuing spike uh, is, uh, increases. When we talk about chronic diseases, typically we see the incidence of disease increasing over time on the horizontal axis. And if we can intervene early on, whatever that exposure is, uh, whether we're talking about cancer or any of the other chronic diseases, um, our idea is to try to intervene as early as possible to see this particular curve tail off and begin to decline, as we indeed see in tobacco-related cancers in men. But now, with under, under this whole notion of global change and the decline of all that sustains life, uh, we've been tampering with the very fabric of life through a continuing expansion of the human enterprise, going from about 1.7 billion people 100 years ago to now exceeding 7 billion people, expected to rise to 8 and 9 billion people soon. With, this, with these kinds of pressures and stresses and demands on all of what nature provides us, these services from nature are changed as we pollute our environments. And these uh, services that we've so taken for granted and indeed even free of charge in their support of life in the commoditization of everything that contributes to the decline in um, life support systems. The effect of the human enterprise and its expansion is a net negative with global impacts such as climate change, declines in air, water, soil quality, as well as food security issues. And of course we see this as headlines in papers all the time these days. A few years ago it 
quite didn't quite make headlines, but certainly since 1992 with the world uh, the first world summit on sustainable development in Rio, these things became more apparent and and more uh, part of our common understanding of what we are doing to the planet. Now, depending on what level we operate as professionals, um, we can operate at a micro lens where we, so to speak, operate on the ground. For example, if you're a physician, you might concern yourself with the physician-patient relationship and we advocate for our patients. If we operate through a meso lens at the community level, we operate from an elevation of, say, 100 meters and we advocate for communities. Some of us work through a macro lens that's at the country or the world or the supranational level, such as United Nations agencies, including the World Health Organization, from an elevation of, say, 10,000 meters, and there we advocate for global health and well-being. And I think the, the key through this lecture is to really find a comfort level for oneself in determining where we feel we can be most effective, whether we operate at the micro, the meso, or the macro level, and uh, recognize that at all of these levels, it's important to recognize that what we do locally has global ramifications, and that there is a need for all of our expertise at all of these levels. Now, in science, um, we often speak of uncertainties, um, and there is often from people who have a vested interest in maintaining the status quo, keeping us on a fossil fuel economy, keeping us in a state of commodities and wastefulness and so on. These people talk to the uncertainty in science and that the prospects of global uh, harms are really hysterical over-exaggerations. But sadly, while there certainly is some uncertainty associated with a lot of what we do in this field, there is very little uncertainty with the following selected indicators that I'll not spend too much time on, but provide them to you as a list since you can go back and look at these slides after the lecture. <clears throat> so the contemporary global scale issues that have major human health implications include all of these bullets. We know well about global geoclimatic system changes with global warming, with sea level increases, ocean acidification. Most recently, the United Nations Environment Program brought to attention just last week that permafrost is melting more, far, more rapidly than previously thought with releases of methane and CO2 levels continuing to increase. I alluded to this earlier with population growth. We're seeing rapid urbanization, the development of megacities, and we're also seeing mass forced and voluntary migrations. We're seeing increases of deserts forcing migrations as well. We're seeing an expansion of consumption intensive lifestyles in particular. We're seeing this philosophy move into China and India, each with populations that exceed a billion people. We've seen overfishing of the oceans with fish stock imbalances. We've seen increases of global and within country disparities, increases in social dis-ease. We'll come to each of one of these in a few minutes as we go through the lecture as well by way of examples. We're seeing fresh water declines everywhere on the planet resurgence of old diseases and the emergence of new diseases. We're hearing about species becoming extinct at accelerating rates with loss, consequent loss of biodiversity. We're committed as a species, it seems, over certainly since the Industrial Revolution of about 175 years ago, to a growth-bound paradigm. We seem to be entrenched in this, which is a system of consumptiveness and wastefulness with places to dispose of waste and to extract whatever it takes to build in obsolescence for everything that we wish to consume. And of course, most recently, we're dealing with a global debt and money crisis 
with the threat of economic collapse. Now any of us in public health know that if we deal with any one of these things, we've seen stories or uh, examples in our texts of consequences for public health of any one of these. What I'm trying to do under eco-epidemiology is to bring this all together as a package for us to focus on. Now I mentioned earlier that I talk about integrity and what we mean by this. When we talk about moral integrity, we're talking about people's ability to distinguish between right and wrong. And essentially, governments usually introduce legislation to uh, keep people on the right path as opposed to the wrong path. When we talk about structural integrity, this really relates to civil engineering where we build buildings that can withstand buffeting winds or heavy rainstorms or even tornadoes and hurricanes. So the build, we say then a building would have integrity. We talk about scientific integrity in the field of ethics and philosophy in our discipline and this refers here uh, under integrity, if scientific integrity, to conducting our science with rigor and impartiality. Basically pursuing the truth as best as we humans are capable of doing this, recognizing the potential for bias in everything that we do. Ecological integrity refers to essentially envir the environment that surrounds us and of course the environment of which we are a part. The whole system functioning that sustains life and we talk about the, eco the, the ecology having integrity when it can withstand perturbations, it has buffering capacity to absorb wastes and yet continue to provide the services that we take so for granted to sustain life by way, as I say, of fresh air, clean water and nutritious soils. And of course, if we dig a little deeper, biological integrity refers to life at the cellular level. What does it take to support life and not interfere with the very basic genetic structures that sustain and help us in our development? Now, when we take all of these questions of integrity, and I'll be really talking about uh, ecological integ integrity, and in this particular slide, I want to show the evidence where we take all of the indicators I showed you in that list of concerns about global declines and show how, these, how profound these declines are from an ecological integrity point of view by all markers of biodiversity. And to show you that between 1982 and 2007, the, that 25 year period saw something like a 50% reduction in biodiversity as measured by independently derived indicators. The independence is important from a scientific uh, coherence point of view. So whether we're looking at the index of, bio, of biotic integrity, thanks to James Carr of the University of Washington from his studies of rivers and streams, whether we're looking at the mean functional integrity measure by Ori Larks of the University of Miami from his study of soils and forests, whether we're looking at the World Wildlife Fund or the World Wide Fund for Nature, 16 different markers, or Canada's own William Rees and Mathis Wagenackel uh, on the ecological footprint, whatever we look at, any of these indicators, suggests that there have been something like 50% declines. Now some of them are declining at different rates from others and the question that we need to ask ourselves is for how much longer can life be sustained with this particular trend? Coincidentally, in a couple of weeks time, the Mayan calendar project projects on the, the summer solstice, I believe, from the Mayan period yeah, that would be about the 21st of December of this year, at the end of life as we know it. Now there are many interpretations to that. Some people jokingly say, well, they simply ran out of wall to extend the calendar. Um, but the reality is that we're a very adaptive species as humans and we tend to say that these calamitous harms m are likely only to happen decades or hundreds of years from now. The sad reality is that all of the changes that I showed you in the list are already happening, but because we're so adaptive, 
Uh, and because most systems can adapt and have buffering ways and rich countries can build buffering in to sustain life by importing food or by exporting waste and so on, um, these, uh, re the reality is that we already are on this downward decline. So the question that I raise is how can epidemiologists contribute to bringing this to attention, to, pub to packaging it in ways that might influence uh, a population or a government uh, sensitive to evidence-based as opposed to ideological-based drivers of change. Let's look at some of the facts of the ecological footprint. For those people who don't know the ecological footprint, if you can imagine the uh, sole of your foot, the heel might constitute the mass of population and the sole, that's like, as in a city, say Toronto or New York, Paris, any city around the planet, and the sole, the rest of the sole of the foot would represent that land mass necessary to sustain people who live in those concentrated cities by way of uh, purifying air, providing fresh water, and assimilating the wastes that are disposed of from those cities. If those cities were to put a dome over themselves and not import or export fresh and wasteful produce that you can imagine would that city would soon implode and collapse under its own uh, pollution. So let's look at how humans have been ignorant or stupid enough not to pay attention to the science that has uh, been provided. I've got a crude series of numbers here of the ecological footprint alone. It has definitions and as we know in epidemiology, no single summary measure tells the whole story, but the ecological footprint has a lot of resonance associated with it. And what we can see that in the United States, well let, let me start at the world, if we in fact believe in equity in the world, then each person on the planet would be entitled to about 1.8 hectares per person. In India, they're able to live on, in 1991, 0.4 hectares per person. In Canada, we had exceeded in 1991 the 1 1.8, where we were sitting at 4.3 hectares per person. The United States was even more demanding and heavy in terms of its demands on the planet than what Canadians were. But despite the knowledge of the footprint, Look at the way this has changed. Globally, we now need 2.2 hectares per person. In India, they went up 100%. Canada went up and the United States went up. At this rate, at, at current rates, we in fact are drawing down what is called ecological capital. It's like going into deep into mortgage or into debt, um, needing not two but two and a half planets if we all were to live at the levels at which we live in the northern countries, the rich countries or the developed world. Now this is all very uh, frightening information in many ways and when uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross pointed out in 1969 in her classic text on death and dying in a can cancer context, she recognized that uh, there are five stages of grief and I've adapted this under the global change broader context to add a sixth one. None of these, it, this, this particular uh, series of stages is not in any hierarchy. If a patient comes into a doctor's office and is told that they've been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and they've probably got no more than six months to live, the person could respond with anger, they could go into a state of denial, it can't be happening, why me, it's not fair. They could uh, hear the news and try to bargain and say, let me just live to see my children graduate, or they could go into a depression, or they could reach a point of acceptance. Now, they may accept it immediately and say, well, particularly if it was related to, say, a smoking-induced cancer, they might say, well, I certainly was warned about the hazards of smoking and now I've got it and, you know, I can accept that and, it's, uh, and I, it'll be okay.
<clears throat> Under global change, we've been warned through the ecological footprint, through the Club of Rome, you may have heard about this group through 1968 with their report in 1972, warning us about peak oil, about the trajectory that we were on with different scenarios and models. Of course, again, powerful moneyed interests tended to poo-poo that report and uh, foment uncertainty in the mind of the public. Also, a lot of us tend not under this situation to take responsibility for the changes. We all continue to live the lifestyles that we've been um, born into and we tend to lay blame and say it's somebody else's fault. So rich countries will blame the poor countries in the world for when we're talking about the global change when they say, well, they're having too many babies, it's their fault or the poor countries will blame the northern rich countries and say it's their fault because they deforested and they consume so much and burn so much fossil fuel that climate change is really their fault. So the whole point about this slide is to show that we're, or to make the point that we're on a very fra in a very delicate situation here and laying blame doesn't really help get out from this uh, situation. To help us get out of the situation, Ehrlich and Holdren in 1971 came up with their seminal piece of work published in Science with this identity called impact is equal to PAT, the PAT identity where P stands for population, A for affluence and T for technology. Uh, population, of course, uh, refers to population growth in the context that I'm using it. Affluence refers to consumptiveness and waste disposal. And T talks about technological uh, abuses of technology, essentially, whether we're talking about armaments, uh, landmines, um, and the belief that technology, through technology, a magic bullet will exist to save us from ourselves. And what I've essentially done is I've adapted this notion of impact and I refer to it as integrity again and say that integrity is a function of population times affluence, remembering that affluence is consumption and waste and technology as are defined, by forcing us to accept that the integrity of systems and that if we're to stop laying blame is functionally related to these three uh, factors. This stresses for us the interdependence of all of these three things in terms of the trajectory of those declines that I showed you in the slide a few moments ago. And it shows us the independence of these forces which often are treated independently as needs for population control, reduced consumption or green technologies. And this identity, I believe, helps us in making our values and our assumptions more transparent in discussing these issues. I can assure you that if you sit at a table at the World Health Organization or the United Nations, you will see countries laying blame and pointing fingers. What one needs to do is park our interests at the door, if that's at all possible for us, when we go into these meetings and discuss rather our values and our assumptions so that solutions might more readily be found. So what this identity does for us is it uh, shows the interplay of all the determinants that is critical if we're going to formulate policy that's going to sustain the planet and life as we know it. So what this identity does again then is it exposes bias and self-interest when the North blames the South or when the South blames the North. It uh, encourages us to recognize our collective interest on this fragile planet. Whether we are north or south, we all have to change our ways in rather profound ways if our goal is sustainability. If we don't do this, it's like rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic as we approach the, ice, the iceberg that causes us to sink. Rearranging the deck chairs, uh, the captain is said to have just told the people, the passengers on the ship, to turn the chairs the other way and not watch the iceberg approaching or tells the orchestra to play a different tune to distract people from this reality. And here's a cartoon uh, 
a picture tells a thousand words, and you can see in 1994 when this cartoon was developed, it was then the G7 countries, including Canada, the United States, the European Union, and others, and in this fragile lifeboat, in giving the picture of lifeboat ethics, the developing country people are all these small folks over here, and at the back they're saying, hey, you up front, stop breeding, and it's the uh, poor impoverished countries, the non so wealthy that don't have the buffering capacity that uh, are dying through what the northern rich countries are in fact uh, consuming and con how they conduct business in the world. The ethics of what we are doing is important from a public health point of view, of course. Uh, this is a cartogram which shows a map of the earth proportional to the particular factor that we're interested in examining. So if we're looking at countries contributing in terms of billions of tons of carbon, we see that the countries contributing are relatively small. Here you see South America, here you see Africa, much smaller than the traditional map as we know geographers to produce maps. And the countries that are contributing, the large contributors, are these so-called old G7 and others in Europe. But when we look under this cartogram at the mortality per million population, the countries most affected are not so much the northern countries contributing to the problem, but the southern countries, the poorer countries. And we need to, if we believe in equity, ask ourselves, is this fair? Is this justice? And in 2009, when Kyoto Accords on climate change, and climate change is just one of the global changes that I spoke to earlier, when we talk about climate change, they talk China and India attack Western climate hypocrites going into these discussions, which we all know resulted in a uh, non-ability to further the Kyoto Accord, because people went in laying blame and expecting the rich countries to at least contribute billions of dollars to poorer countries for the harms caused through overconsumptiveness in the rich countries. So I referred to the lifeboat ethics earlier. We see communities, and indeed, this is in happening globally, richer countries, people are living in gated communities or cluster communities with guards at the gates, and we're talking of moving into fortress nations as disparities continue to widen and we become increasingly polarized. And this polarization, as any of us who've read the history of health in, pop in populations, polarization leads to social disease, war, hunger, and uh, death. So how can we affect that? We've, through the slides you've seen, the changes that are taking place have expanding reach. They're changing at accelerating rates. As habitats change, new uh, pathogens will find those habitats um, uh, conducive to their um, survivability and their uh, progress in the world, while other pathogens will not be able to survive in those habitats. With all of these changes, what should we expect by way of public health practice? What, if any, is the role of eco and environmental epidemiology and the other specialists? What about questions of environmental and bioethics? And what about law? I'll address, on each, uh, I'll address each of these as we go through the slides. In, I believe it was 2009, James Lovelock produced his most recent book, The Vanishing Face of Gaia. Gaia was the conceptualization that he furthered, James Lovelock did, in the, when the 1960s came along and it was possible to see the fragility of this uh, spherical object called the Earth floating in space. And he saw the Earth as a self-regulating organism where whatever you do on one part of the planet had perturbations or ramifications on other parts of the planet. And James Lovelock, in his book, talks to the fact that we've gone beyond global warming, but we're actually committed to global heating. And people who study uh, the ability of humans to live in a planet much more than two degrees Celsius on average warmer than what we have, know that this is like 
boiling frogs, the frogs will stay in the beaker as the water warms and then they will die instead of jumping out of the beaker and finding a more habitable place elsewhere. In case you haven't noticed, we have only one planet Earth. There is nowhere else to go, so it's therefore even more incumbent upon us as epidemiologists to help inform and bring this information to the public and policy makers. And the reason we should be concerned about this is that uh, matters of a global nature, we need to prevent harms on a massive scale, and we need to respect that not only do we in our present generation have a right to life, but so do future generations. So here's a definition then of eco-epidemiology. I see it as a subspecialty of epidemiology, focusing on the relationships between human health and the dynamics of global ecological change. Now, with the, focus on, with the focus of epidemiology being on prevention, so is that of eco-epidemiology. And as per the two slides that I showed earlier with communicable disease and chronic diseases, what we're trying to do in eco-epidemiology, to show this pictorially, if indeed the ecological systems that sustain life are in decline, what I'm proposing is that we would like to be able to find a sensitive enough measure of social, of social um, well-being, uh, of some health indicator, that as things, with this, things getting worse going vertical up on, this, uh, on the vertical axis, um, we would like to be able to show that things are, as the ecology is worsening, so the health of the population is worsening. And why do we want to do this? So that we might intervene at an earlier stage than waiting for this kind of thing to happen where a tipping point is reached and there are calamitous harms in the future with uh, massive uh, harms that could have been prevented. We've heard uh, Mervyn Sasser and others on the topic of eco-epidemiology since 1996. They've spoken of the differentiation needed from the dominant paradigm for addressing risk factor epidemiology, embracing higher level determinants in a world of complexity. This is somewhat different than what I'm talking about at the primordial level of prevention. So primordial level of prevention, we're talking about policy shifts for health benefits, the co-benefits of making these changes from going to a green economy, having cleaner air, there are massive economic benefits to be derived from this as well as to go to the more serious point of what about future preserving the planet for future generations. So how best can we inform such policies? And it's not necessarily only through ecological study designs where we study aggregate data, but certainly we could conceptualize treating nations as individuals, as in ecological study designs, but also individuals. About a dozen years ago, a former student of mine, Lee Siswerda, uh, we published this in 2001. But what we did in this piece of work, we took some traditional health indicators, such as life expectancy, percent low birth weight babies, and infant mortality, and thought that it would be interesting to see if there was any correlation with between any of these um, traditional health indicators and any change that could be measured by way of ecological degradation. And this was done on a country basis. So we tried to link life expectancy, low birth weight babies and infant mortality to loss of forest cover, to various other measures of ecological decline as available in, at that time in the late 1990s on global databases. But in fact, because of all kinds of problems as well, uh, being a pioneering piece of work, there was um, access to data was a, a big problem. And out of some 196 countries at the time, uh, we could only have complete data sets on about 44 of them. But the, we felt that the analysis was indeed uh, unbiased and worth proceeding with. And in fact, we found no association between what we thought was intuitively linkable, 
such as life expectancies declining if forest cover was being lost. But in fact, thanks to the founder of the Ecological Footprint, William Rees, who was on the supervisory committee of uh, Lise's word at the time, we realized that wealth in fact is the buffer, that the countries that have in fact degraded their environments are the wealthier countries. And by definition, therefore, they have the capacity to import foods, to build structures that are not subject to hurricanes and tornadoes, and they can indeed continue to survive. But the question is, for how long can this continue? But perhaps from a public health point of view, what happens to those who live in poverty without the buffer of wealth? Mark Anielski, who uh, is based out of Edmonton in Canada, studied at Redefining Progress in San Francisco in the, I believe it was the 1990s, and developed for the province of Alberta a genuine progress indicator for economic, personal, societal and environmental well-being. And what he uh, brought to my attention long ago was that economic growth, which is the single most important measure that is used by most all governments throughout the world today in the name of the GDP, Gross Domestic Product, or GNP, Gross National Product. And he shows that it's much more important to look at genuine progress of societies not based solely on gross domestic product or gross national product, but to look at it in three dimensions, economic, societal, uh, personal, and environmental dimensions. And here are some examples of other economic indicators, not just GDP, but economic diversity, trade, taxes, savings rates, household debt, under personal societal, look at the degree of poverty in society, how much free time, parenting and elder care, obesity, suicides, and so on, and under environmental, look at oil and gas reserve life, fish and wildlife, wetlands, peatlands, what is the quality of these things, what is our ecological footprint? And he showed by combining, here we have not just one indicator, but if you count this up, there are 51 indicators, I believe, that when you compare over the period 1961 to 1999, the GDP, you see growth. And we all know how governments and people in society pat themselves on the back when they say, oh, and GDP is expected to go by, grow up by 2%, by 5%, by 6% this year. And this is why we see growth, and those of us in health know that growth is, uh, and there's a wonderful book by John McMurtry out of the University of Guelph called The Cancer Stage of Capitalism, that uncontrolled growth is, will, will eventually kill the host. So when you look at this kind of growth over time in a finite world where we cannot expand the economy indefinitely, that we are going to soon hit a, hit a ceiling where there will be feedback loops that are going to have profound ramifications on all life as we know it. Whereas using, again, as epidemiologists looking for good indicators, the GPI, the Genuine Progress Indicator shows, or the Genuine Progress Indicator of well -be or Well-Being Index, shows that in fact, and this resonates with most people, where you find families working, children working early, hardly ever having meals together, struggling to sustain themselves, even in the richer countries. We all hear about the 1%, the 99%, or the 90-10 split. I'll come to that in just a moment. Since the work that we did uh, with uh, Siswerda, which was published in the journal Epidemiology in 2001, Heinen and Martens out of the, out of the Netherlands did, replicated that work. Uh, Raynham out of Halifax replicated that work, and Hitton Hendricks most recently did a very innovative piece of work showing that it is possible to link, there isn't time in this lecture to go into what they were able to, each of these was able to link, but you can certainly find these references if you're interested. Uh, other authors of note, Bridging Ecosystem Change and Health, of course, uh, John Last, Public Health and Human Ecology, first edition in 87, Tony McMichael, Planetary Overload in 1993, Aaron and Pat's Ecosystem Change in Public Health, Butler, 
Rotman and Martens, again, these are the folks out of the University of Maastricht in the Netherlands. All of these people have been real pioneers in thinking about these global issues and how public health and epidemiology in particular might help us deal with the many factors that go into formulating the kinds of hypotheses that are needed to try to inform policy. Now, the whole idea of why it's important to open our minds is uh, to look at the very question of what goes into formulating a hypothesis. Hypotheses really are formulated on the basis of our own lived experience. And we are all human beings, wherever we are in the world, despite our uh, waving our hands and claiming that we're not, we're all brainwashed to some degree. We're all indoctrinated by propaganda. After all, we see what we read. And as the media becomes more monopolistic, um, we, the editorial policies are more aligned with uh, right-wing agendas. And this is very problematic. There are some newspapers that are, however, able to include, even on the front page today, some of these profoundly important issues. So this is a very hopeful sign that things are changing. The issue is, can we help them change in time enough to uh, see effects that will prevent these catastrophic harms that are suggested by the graphs that I showed you earlier? We all live by dogma, something held as authoritative without substantiation. We feel we have some entitlement to benefits. We don't seem to be able to distinguish between humility and arrogance, and I'll come to that in the definition of the principle of solidarity in a moment. We're all very hypocritical. Sometimes when I give this lecture to a small group of people, I ask people to hold hands, and I stand in front of the room and I say, hello, my name is Colin, and I'm a hypocrite. You'll recognize that analogy with Alcoholics Anonymous. It's only when you can recognize that you have a problem that you can start to address the problem. And the reason I call myself a hypocrite is because my footprint is enormous by virtue of how much I travel. And air travel is very uh, heavy in terms of carbon emissions. So it's very difficult for us to walk the talk. Do we do what we preach? Uh, some people say I'm justified in doing it because I'm able through these lectures and learning with my colleagues in Australia and elsewhere uh, about these issues and to spread the word on a massive scale. Uh, we all live, spend, and consume as if there is no tomorrow. And this could indeed turn out to be a self-fulfilling prophecy. We're all manipulated uh, to control for one's own advantage by, by interests. Um, there's this entity called the military-industrial-academic complex. It's an alliance that influences government policy. We live by myths. These are unfounded or false notions of how we came to be and what our purpose really is on the planet. There are paradigms. These are frameworks that are used to describe reality. We live a lot by self-interest. We, we concern ourselves for our own advantage, failing to recognize that as social beings, the collective is more important than ourselves. Um, there are issues of sociopathy. Uh, sociopaths are people who are con artists who sway the exploitable with no regard to their rights in pursuit of power. In, in pursuit of power. And I make the distinction between sociopaths and psychopaths. Psychopaths will actually kill other people uh, at uh, point-blank range, whereas sociopaths do these things more discreetly on a much even grander scale. And then there's this whole issue of how delusional we are. We believe strongly despite superior evidence to the contrary. So again, can we as individual epidemiologists in recognizing these frailties of what it is to be human help to advance knowledge and inform policy? And this really leads to the very issue of is science value free or is science value neutral? Well, the answer is uh, when I used to ask this question perhaps in the 1980s, to a class of students, almost every student would put up their hands and say, yes, of course, science is value-free or value-neutral. But what's fascinating is to see, and this is a very hopeful sign, that even among students of science today, most people agree that it is absolutely not value-neutral. And the answer to the question that I've just asked is, science strives to be value-free and impartial. <coughs> 
but the instrument of science, that is ourselves, we're incapable of being value free. And let's look at the real upstream determinants at the country level of what makes for our values. Let's look at how the United States was founded, and I'll show Canada and France as well in just a moment. Um, Canada was founded, uh, I'm sorry, the United States was founded under the uh, maxim of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, it's documented in the Declaration of Independence, formulated by these people, Franklin, Jefferson, Locke, in 1776. And it, I think it's fair to say that most Americans grow up hardwired to believe that they have all of these rights, the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Notice in this no reference to duties. I'll come back to that when I talk about the Earth Charter in uh, the hopeful uh, part of the, the lecture. The last 25% uh, of this lecture will be focusing on hopeful indicators. Um, so, uh, sorry, let me just, whoops. Let me just go back to those libertarian. The, in the United States, this country was essentially founded on libertarian values. These are not issues of, of liberal party politics as we know it in most of the world, but on liberty of the individual, the right of the individual, the right to function in a tax-free environment because taxes for the common good are not seen as a, as a virtue in libertarian-based economies. This is in part why it would be extremely difficult for the United States to increase taxes for any purpose for the common good. In the United States, they're going to need to examine the enlightened self-interest that would come from what comes from increasing taxes even for individual liberty. But that would be beyond the scope of this lecture and beyond my abilities to develop that philosophic approach. In France, around the same time, just after the United States' independence, that country was founded on egalitarian values. And this is their maxim, liberty, equality, and fraternity, brotherhood. If they cannot afford to eat bread, let them eat cake, was the quote attributed to Marie Antoinette. I believe the English translation takes some liberties. This isn't quite what she is alleged to have said but it does make the point of the insensitivity of leadership when the farmers thronged outside the palace and the king and his wife stood on the balcony and suggested, why are you complaining that you don't have enough bread? If you can't afford bread, eat cake. And that led in turn to the French Revolution. From a public health point of view, this kind of thing is of course to be avoided as best we can. Canada, on the other hand, was founded on communitarian values, a much greater focus on community through what sounds to many people as a very dull maxim, as a very uninspiring maxim, peace, order, and good government. Why does it sound dull? Because it isn't as exciting as all the rights that are suggested in libertarian set of values of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Here, there's far more duties to ensure peace order and good government, and that's embedded in the Constitution Act somewhat later than the founding fathers of the United States and in France. But this is to show how communitarian values create for a different set of values and why it is in Canada that despite right-wing pushes to or pulls to move us away from universal access to health care, the public stands very firmly and demands that we keep it. On the topic of ethics, um, bioethics, medical ethics, as we know, bio of course refers to the, bio, the biosphere more than anything, but it's somehow been uh, the focus of medical ethics in, the t in this meaning of this term bioethics. We talk about four um, principles. The principle of respect for autonomy, which talks about the right of the individual to self-determine whether they want to participate or not in a study, whether they wish to be subjected to surgery or not. And we talk about telling the truth and honoring our, honoring our promises and telling the truth. The second principle 
is doing good, beneficence, do no harm, non-maleficence, and the fourth principle is social and distributive just justice, uh, where we ensure equity in the distribution of benefits and risks of research and policy. I like to add this uh, perpetual reminder that we as scientists need to be have as great integrity as possible and ensure impartiality as best we can in the science that we do and this usually re requires oversight of committees and so on. But when we extend from medical ethics to public health ethics and more in particular to environmental ethics, we need to consider the principle of protecting the most vulnerable in society, protecting unborn children, Aboriginal communities, the frail elderly, um, kids growing up in very rapid developmental stages, because clearly if we protect the most vulnerable, then all are protected from pollution and stress indicators. The other important uh, principle is that we should involve communities in our research. This ensures, as an applied science, which, what, which is what epidemiology is, that we will ensure community relevance of our work. Again, integrity in public health requires that we serve the public health interest above any other interest. There are many other principles that apply, but since I'm talking about, uh, that apply in public health, but since I'm focusing on global ecological change, I'll talk here, speak here to the precautionary principle. Uh, this is essentially the principle of preventive medicine. That's if you even suspect that something may be causing harm, let's first demonstrate that it's not causing harm before we start counting bodies and say, whoops, it doesn't, it did indeed cause harm and we could have acted earlier. The post-cautionary principle came from Lisa Heinzeling from, I believe it's Georgetown University in the States, when she realized about six years ago or so that we had missed the boat in terms of being preventative in climate change, and she said we now have to focus on being post-cautionary and help communities and societies to adapt to the harms that were going to come from a changing climate. Environmental justice we've all heard about. Bill Clinton uh, recognized this as a separate field with offices established within the United States Public Health Service on environmental justice. Um, issues of communities who are located downwind from polluting sources or on polluting sources, do we relocate them? Do we give them compensation for the downward spiral that would affect their health or that their health would be thrown into by virtue of their simple location or the jobs that they're forced to do. The polluter pays is another principle to try to encourage people not to uh, pollute. If you catch people polluting and make them pay, that would be a disincentive for them. The seventh generation principle is one that should resonate nicely with uh, people who are familiar with uh, native cultures, Aboriginal cultures, First Nation cultures in Canada. The seventh generation principle is, as it says, that before you decide any action today, consider what the consequences of that action might be seven generations down the line. Imagine if our governments today, globally, were, were, were able to be influenced by or have their decisions trumped any principle for economic growth or for anything else would be trumped by consideration of the seventh generation principle. If we were to consider what the consequences of these decisions might be, we might in fact move from a path of decline to one of sustainability. The principle of solidarity I said I'd mentioned earlier, this requires concerted action, especially on matters of a global nature and why is it needed? Well, what goes around comes around in our world that is essentially a seamless web. I indicated to you the um, self-regulating organism that James Lovelock saw the planet Earth as being. And um, what did we see instead in Canada under the uh, more right-wing governments that we've elected over the years? We see that we will find a made in Canada or a made in Alberta solution to the development of the 
uh, tar sands or oil sands or bituminous sands, however you care to call it. Voluntary compliance is often suggested of industry to enforce laws rather than enforcement mechanisms. Now all of these responses are totally counter to the principle of solidarity. And under these principles, of course, or under this notion of finding local solutions and ignoring the solutions that are seen as necessary at a global level uh, are to fly in the face of solidarity with a common cause. And they tend to demonstrate far too much self-interest. It's like having the fox essentially guard the hen house. So what is it then that we need to be aware of as epidemiologists and as members of society, we must be aware of that, that there are forces at play that influence both scientific direction and policy directions. And if we are to be responsible citizens and responsible professionals, we have to have great vigilance and personal integrity if we're going to see a change in course. But what do we see in our face flies, flies in the face of everything that I've been saying so far. Any time a scientist comes up or anyone presents to a powerful moneyed interest or a group that has a powerful in, uh, a vested interest in maintaining the status quo, what is their initial reaction or response to your suggestion that A may cause B? They'll deny the problem. They'll blame the victim. They'll say it's not because of asbestos exposure, it's because they smoke. It's not because of Canadian asbestos, it's because they smoke. They'll say things like that. If you persist and are tenacious enough, they'll, they may offer you some money to go back and do another, another study. And while you've gone away to do what we so enjoy doing and counting things and measuring things and doing more science and publishing more papers, what is this really doing in terms of policy? It's delaying. So sometimes we say we have enough knowledge to change policy. By all means, continue doing science and be willing to go back and revisit the policy if the science should suggest that the policy be changed, but there's sometimes enough knowledge to act immediately rather than to keep delaying. And the delay, of course, serves the status quo. While we're doing the research that we originally uh, accepted the funding for, the powerful moneyed interests will actually find other scientific groups who will be willing, given the softness of our science, to design studies in ways that will actually show that whatever we were claiming causing harm may indeed cause no harm or may even indeed, indeed be a benefit. We know this by wonderful examples through the now complete jigsaw puzzle of the whole smoking and tobacco uh, industry influence on science. So this creates division, foments uncertainty and foments dissent among scientists. And if we still persist, the fourth D in this particular hierarchy or this particular paradigm is they will discredit us. If we continue to insist, they'll undermine our credibility by whatever means are at their disposal to do so. So um, you might even want to put in a fifth D and there, there are some other paradigms with many more Ds than this. But if those of you remember Meryl Streep in the movie Silkwood, there was an example of denial, delay, discredit, dismiss and even death. So, you know, people say of, uh, of public health, it's not for the, the meek and mild. It's uh, if you can't stand the heat, get out the kitchen. But you do have to stand up for the public interest if, uh, if you want to be effective in the public health realm, and in particular in the uh, realm of, best, or of uh, global change, because the vested interests are so powerful in maintaining the existing paradigms that we're in. In fact, it's not me just ranting about this right now, but there's the manufacture of doubt. I'm just giving you two examples of recent books. David Michaels under Obama was appointed to head up OSHA. Um, doubt is their product. 2008 Oxford University Press, Deborah Davis, The Secret History of the War on Cancer, and her other books as well. And what, what is the point in fomenting doubt and all of this? It's because policymakers find it difficult to make policy in the face of uncertainty. And we have to show some humility towards the policymaker. And our job as scientists is to do the excellent science that we can to, in fact, uh, 
make more precise and less uncertain the um, relationships that we're bringing to public attention. And by increasing uncertainty, the policymaker's ability to implement health and policy is made more difficult. And essentially, what Michaels, Davis, and other authors have shown, authors on the asbestos area and their, their books, books on there's libraries on this topic, they are essentially designed, they have infrastructures and lawyers and teams of people and scientists who will prostitute themselves to those interests to subvert and ambush science. Way back in 1983, Clayson and Halpin in the Journal of Public Health Policy made this observation. Industry's offensive against the regulation of health and safety hazards uses academics to downplay or deny the seriousness of the hazards. Here's an example, a picture telling a thousand words again. In 2004, in the Edmonton Journal, was this cartoon on the editorial page. It came out at the time when Teflon was linked to birth defects. And here's the man and the person in the street with his frying pan and the great advantages of Teflon. And the manufacturer of Teflon, DuPont at the time, the fat cat over here, the executive, saying, don't worry, the accusation won't stick. What does he have in mind there? Don't worry, we'll find scientists who will do studies that show that perhaps Teflon is not a risk for reproductive of hazards and so on. To show you the lengths to which uh, wealthy corporations will go, um, in 2008, when in preparation and anticipation of that 2009 follow-up to the Kyoto meeting that took place in Copenhagen, I showed you this the slide of the, the the newspaper clipping where China was accusing the West of being uh, hypocrites. Here you see an example of right-wing think tanks funded by powerful vested interest um, actually having the audacity out of the United States, the gumption, call it what you will, but the business interest to actually infiltrate every Canadian young child's mind by sending 11,000 brochures and DVDs to kids' libraries to tell them, essentially, that climate change has nothing to do with uh, the human enterprise. I believe that was the essence of that message. Now, there are orthodox and unorthodox approaches to dealing with these very large, broad issues. I mean, it's for one single individual to carry all of this weight on the shoulders is too much to bear. But as we deconstruct it and, and look at it carefully, I think it becomes quite um, graspable and, uh, and, and we can in fact find areas whether we're at, as I said before, the meso, the macro or the micro level of work. Albert Einstein made the point that, uh, this is a quote that we see many times, the significant problems that we face today from our current patterns of thinking cannot be solved by the same pattern of thinking which created them. We hear these kinds of statements, we've got to stop thinking inside the box, we have to think outside the box. We've got to stop thinking in linear, reductionist ways. We've got to embrace complexity. This whole idea on which our universities were founded on unidisciplinary, these siloed, compartmentalized disciplines, where we, where we move to interdisciplinary, where we talk with one another, more than talking at one another in multidisciplinary contexts, where we have to move to transdisciplinary approaches to addressing these issues of complexity. I'll give you a nice definition of transdisciplinary in just a moment. And I spoke about the rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. Well, here there's Band-Aid solutions as opposed to systemic solutions are needed. Band-Aid solutions would be telling the orchestra to play a different tune on the Titanic or turning the deck chairs to face away from the iceberg but we need, indeed, systemic solutions to the problems that face us today. The definition of transdisciplinarity, these are approaches to human health that integrate the natural, social, and health sciences in a humanities context and in so doing transcend each of their traditional boundaries. The emergent concepts and methods are the hallmark of the transdisciplinary effort. Let me focus on the distinction between reductionism and system approaches. Reductionism is where we pursue a single cause along a linear path to explain a phenomenon. 
And one way of conceptualizing this is to see a deep well that we dig into the ground or a silo where we continually digging down, down, down to try to find what's the cause or the connection between A and B. And in that process, if you can conceptualize this nicely, you will begin to see that you're so deep in a hole that you cannot see the connectedness of what you're discovering with other scientists and what they're discovering. So there becomes a need to be integrative across all the sciences. And this is why many universities today and granting councils are encouraging interdisciplinarity, transdisciplinary thinking and research. Which leads to systems approaches or holism which are integrative, multi, inter and transdisciplinary approaches to explain a phenomenon that embrace, embraces complexity. In the 1990s, Funtowitz and Ravitz developed what's called post-normal science. And this really is a science to address environmental policy under conditions of complexity. And they published work through the 90s. And they make the distinction between what most of us were trained to do, this linear reductionist under Newtonian approaches versus complexity paradigms. And just to uh, sensitize you to these distinctions, we talk about reductionism under Newtonian pro processes or uh, paradigms versus holism, thinking holistically under complexity. Under Newtonian approaches, we want to be predictable under complexity, we embrace the fact of unpredictability. This is linear versus nonlinear. Under complexity, we acknowledge uncertainty. We accept it as part of the reality. Newtonian tends to be deterministic versus non-deterministic in complexity, and Newtonian sciences embrace and seek system equilibrium whereas in complexity, the idea is to embrace instabilities. So there's an alternative paradigm that we as eco-epidemiologists need to look at carefully. If any of you want any references to any of the things that I'm talking about throughout where references are not provided and you can't find them, don't hesitate. My email address is on the first slide as well as on the last slide. Don't hesitate to ask. Here is a toolkit of at least eight tools. Integrated assessment, scenario analysis, this is under post-normal science, participatory methods of community engagement, ecological footprint analysis and the disaggregated footprint analysis, the DIPSI model developed by the World Health Organization, this was more in relation to, con uh, to, to traffic um, collisions and so on, drivers and pressures that make things the way they are in the world, Product life cycle analysis. I spoke earlier about the identity of uh, impact is this PA, PAT, the population, affluence and technology, and Kuznets curves. These are all interesting post-normal approaches to formulating hypotheses and conducting both quantitative and qualitative research. So what are the prom most promising solutions to these problems? This is the more, I've, I've shown you all the doom and gloom stuff prior, indicating that there are some very exciting and hopeful things happening. But now I'm going to focus on the promising solutions. I want to also make the important distinction between anthropocentrism and eco or biocentrism. Anthropocentrism is where we focus, where everything is centered around human survival, survivability and well-being as opposed to the survivability of life at its very core. And I hope throughout this, by the end of this lecture, you don't see me as being an anthropocentrist. In fact, I'm a biocentrist. I believe that if we protect the most vulnerable form of life as it's, at its very beginnings at the cellular level, then all life will flourish. So what do we do? What is the hopeful sign? We are busy reconnecting humans to their complete dependence on the ecosystems in which they live. If you remember the first slide that I showed, I asked you to think about, are we dependent on these ecosystems? I hope by now you will agree that indeed we are. And that we are also recognizing that new approaches are needed to move us from our silo-based and compartmentalized ways of doing things to be more integrated in seeing how the parts are all connected.
I mentioned before that we need to think globally and act locally. The seventh generation principle is one that I think can help us see this in a very practical way. What are the cumulative consequences of local actions that are taken? So we have grave challenges before us, but individually and collectively I think that we see a lot of opportunity and hope. Here are eight identified things. There are several others that many of you I'm sure will be able to add to this list, but these are eight that I think are important. I'm going to touch on each of them. The Earth Charter, constitutions and bills of rights, teaching about sustainability, here I'm giving a lecture on the topic, local land ethics are being developed through the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, there are localization movements and transition towns that are forming where people are trying to be less hypocritical and walk the talk. There are web websites today that are global. These things did not exist about 10 years ago. Talking about what I'm talking about was seen as absolutely peripheral and fringe uh, by the powerful interests and the dominant paradigm, as it's called, the, the, the mythology by which we live. Even the Pentagon, the World Bank just last week, and many reports are coming out warning about the threat of collapse. That is the collapse of life support systems. There are fu funding institutions for younger people who are looking to support work in this area. There are non-governmental organizations that can be joined that invest in paradigm change. So what is the Earth Charter? The Earth Charter came about First, in 1992, with the First World Summit on Sustainable Development by Maurice Strong, actually a, a Canadian, who started this development, but it was not quite fully baked by then. The government leaders in Rio in 1992 were not willing to consider it for all kinds of reasons. That's a lecture in, to, in and of itself. Um, but what the, Maurice Strong then did was make alliances with uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, the former Soviet leader, and got the support of people like Stephen Rockefeller, who I call the one non-sociopath of the Rockefeller family that I'm aware of. And they came up with this uh, wonderful document. It's available on the website that you see here of the Earth Charter in about 50 different languages. There are community groups that are trying to advance the thinking of the Earth Charter. And the bottom line is it has four major principles to save us from ourselves essentially as a species. There's a short preamble. It takes all of about 15 minutes to read this document. The first principle is respect and care for the community of life, ecological integrity, social and economic justice, democracy, nonviolence, and peace, and then a about two-thirds of a page on the way that we can move this concern forward. Each of these four principles has four sub-principles and a few principles beneath each of those which essentially are designed and provided to help us uh, operationalize this Earth Charter. And the key in the Earth Charter is to see if it resonates with us as individuals and if it does to embrace it and to try to live our lives according to these principles. These principles are principles of duties that fly in the face of all the rights or that counterbalance all the rights. Let me rather put it that way, that counterbalance all the rights that we have that provide duties if, we're going to, if we believe in equity and care about the future. It has prevention in focus for the support of all life, biocentrism there, and its interdependence. I'll move on to the South African Bill of Rights. Um, in 1996, South Africa was among the first countries in the world when it moved from uh, authoritarian rule to democracy to, in 1994 to adopt its Bill of Rights in 1996. And this was one of the first to have as an individual right in, any, in that country to an environment that is not harmful to the health and well-being of people. Future generations are noted. The requirement to prevent pollution and ecological degradation to secure ecologically sustainable development. These concerns are unusual 
We might ask ourselves, do we see such things in Canada or the United States? Certainly not enshrined in our bills of rights, not yet anyway. Many other countries since the mid-1990s, including not only developing countries or countries in transition, but Brazil, Colombia, Ecuador, Cuba, France was one of them. They all built this kind of language into their constitutions and bills of rights. What does that mean to individual citizens? Well, it means that as an individual citizen, if you feel that your government in these countries that have enshrined these things in their constitutions and bills of rights is not directing policies in ways that protect the environment, you can challenge the government. The problem with it, of course, as you can imagine, to do, to make such a challenge, it's not just a question of cost, but it can take many years to prevail at the end of the day and get a judgment. So the question then emerges, well, how much time do we have to see this? The issue that is most um, important in this consideration, though, is that it sets a tone for the country. It sets a very rich direction that this is to be protected, and that's important. It sets a new norm for conduct. In fact, David Boyd out of Canada just published a book out of the University of British Columbia Press and dealing with the entire analysis of what I've just introduced to you here. Um, I published a book, uh, senior edited, a collection called Sustaining Life on Earth, and the Faculty of Business at the University of Alberta was enthusiastic enough, the dean at the time, to ask me to teach a course, an interdisciplinary course, on values, ethics, and sustainability. This highly interdisciplinary course reveals the extent to which the system is broken, how we have come to the point of systems collapse, and how a major overhaul might be managed frames the issues and so on. That's the book that that course was based on. Envir the subtitle is Environmental and Human Health Through Global Governance and it's essentially based on uh, or, or rooted in and foundational upon the Earth Charter. Advanced praise for this book from Bill McKibben, the uh, author of many other books, Deep Economy in the 11th Hour, the leader of www350.org to promote local actions to get countries and citizens around the world to get their governments to act on climate change, to reduce continuing in emissions of CO2, methane and other things. This book is a powerful attempt to prove that human intelligence and the institutions it has created possess power enough to blunt the force of our ecological destructiveness destructiveness. It provides a light for the path, one that is badly needed. I mentioned before the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. There's a phenomenal project, project on the southern shores of Lake Michigan called the Indiana Dunes, Dunes which is a, a, re, a, a refurbishment, a redevelopment, uh, if you will, where they removed the steel industry and these beaches, the buffering capacity is shown for these systems to come back to life in wonderful ways. In Camrose, Alberta, at the Augustana campus of the University of Alberta, a few years ago I learned of a movement there to do something similar, where they come up with local ethics, local land ethics for the communities. There are websites, many websites, based out of Edmonton. I've just listed three here. But if you just do a search on the web, you will find many. If you're concerned about the veracity of any of these websites, don't hesitate to ask me and I'll gladly share them with you. This one is most interesting, the Global Footprint Network. I always have my students do this. Um, you can go in and calculate your own individual footprint, which is the basis for my telling you that I'm a hypocrite by virtue of how much I travel. Um, if it's 1.8, uh, mine is around 17. Many of ours is very high in the developed world. There are foundations and non-governmental organizations that are investing in paradigm shifts, in a change in paradigm. Some, and these are just three that I happened to put down when I thought of presenting the slide, the World Watch Institute, the Earth Institute, David Suzuki Foundation, and many, many others. These are very hopeful signs. One can think of working with some of these organizations as well.
There are mainstream institutions I referred earlier to the Pentagon, the World Bank, and many reports warning, warning about the threat of collapse. Some people may remember about four or five years ago, Nicholas Stern out of the United Kingdom showing that a small investment in preventing climate change would pay back in spades in terms of the economic costs that will come by ignoring this issue. There are supranational organizations through the United Nations agencies, but the question is where are our leaders and who are, to whom are they beholden? Social movements and movies. I cannot even begin to tell you how many wonderful movies there are and how many social movements there have been. Most young people will be most familiar with the more recent development of the Occupy movement, the Zeitgeist movement, the most recent movie, movie. It's two hours and 40 minutes long. I encourage you to take the time to watch it if you are concerned about any of these things that I've been talking about today. The Journey of the Universe is another one. Another movie is called Home. These are wonderful movies essentially put out by Swedes, people in New York, and all over the world. Well worth the time to understand the breadth and depth of these issues, and most excitingly, to see the level of understanding that is being developed to help us shift paradigms. The localization movement and transition towns that I referred to, I spoke about Mark Nielsky of the Genuine Progress Indicator. He published a book in 2007, I believe, The Economics of Happiness. And interestingly enough, by the same title, there's a movie by Helena Norberg-Hodge, director of the International Society for Ecology and Culture, by the same title, The Economics of Happiness. Uh, student groups at the University of Alberta showed The Economics of Happiness, which was how I was introduced to this about a year and a half ago. Um, a two-week meeting in October 2010 on the Convention of Biological Diversity. This convention was 17 years in the making, but in 2010, another very hopeful sign, 190 countries came together, and interestingly enough, you've heard me speak about ethics at the opening session of the very, the very last sentence of the head of the United Nations Environment Program. In his sentence, he said, we must approach biodiversity conservation from an ethical point of view. So with that particular, in October 2010, this bi biology conservation, uh, they said uh, it was recognized that a historic deal to halt the mass extinction of species was finally agreed to in what conservationists see as the most important international treaty aimed at preventing the collapse of the world's wildlife and you can read that for yourself at that site. My second last slide is to simply point out to you that um, there is an International Association for Ecology and Health. There are other societies. Some people don't talk about uh, eco-health, but talk about One Health. Essentially, as I see it, they're one and the same thing. There may be some hope that these fragmented organizations in turn will come together, in my view, but you can find it on this website publishing uh, terrific journals. The forerunner was that, again, was a Canadian. Um, and um, I would simply, in conclusion, encourage you to discuss what you've learned here with others and feel free to follow up by emailing me. Thanks very much. <laughs>